At first glance, it might just look like a massive construction site. Bulldozers, cranes, and endless concrete. But what you're actually looking at is China building its first major canal in over a thousand years. And not just anywhere, through some of the most rugged terrain in southern China. You've probably seen how fast China builds. Bridges that stretch across entire valleys. Railways that cut straight through mountains. But this time, they're doing something different. This is Pinglu Canal, one of China's most ambitious infrastructure projects in recent history. It stretches 134.2 kilometers, just over 83 miles, starting from the Xijin Reservoir in Hengzhou and ending at the Qinjiang River, which flows into the Beibu Gulf. That final connection is what makes the canal so important. It turns landlocked areas deep inside Guangxi into potential export hubs. China has a long history of building artificial canals. The most famous, the Grand Canal, is over 1,700 kilometers long and helped power the country's economy for centuries. It allowed grain to flow from the fertile south to the political capitals in the north and played a key role in unifying the country's transport system during the Sui and Tang dynasties. But after that golden age of waterway construction, China largely shifted its focus. Roads, railways, and air travel took center stage, especially after the 20th century. Water transport took a back seat. For over a thousand years, no new major man-made canal was built in the country. So why revive the idea now? Well, it's because China's economic map has changed. While the East Coast is still a manufacturing powerhouse, Central and Western provinces like Chongqing, Guizhou, and Sichuan are growing fast. These regions are far from the sea, and getting goods from factories there to ports like Shanghai or Shenzhen takes time and money. A canal offers a more efficient alternative. It's cheaper than rail, uses less energy than trucks, and can move massive amounts of cargo. That's why the Pinglu Canal is not just about reviving an old tradition, it's about solving a very modern problem. And just like the Grand Canal once reshaped the internal economy of ancient China, this one is being built to connect a new part of the country to the global market. But this project is not just about pouring concrete. It's about logistics, strategy, economics, and maybe a bit of politics too. On paper, Digging a 134-kilometer canal through mountains and hills sounds like overkill, especially in a country that already has some of the busiest highways and most advanced high-speed rail in the world. But this is not about building something flashy. This is about solving a very real logistics problem. Much of western and southwestern China, places like Guizhou, Yunnan, and Sichuan, is packed with industries. You'll find factories, coal mines, steel plants, cement producers. But all of these regions share one thing. They're landlocked. Getting goods from there to ports on the East Coast, like Shanghai or Shenzhen, can mean a journey of over 1,000 kilometers. It's slow. It's expensive. And it depends heavily on overworked rail lines and highways. The Pinglu Canal changes that. It gives these inland provinces a direct water route to the sea via the Beibu Gulf in southern Guangxi. That's a big deal for businesses that ship heavy bulk cargo, where even small savings in transport can mean the difference between profit and loss. And it's not just a logistical fix, it's part of a much larger strategy. The canal plays a key role in China's new international land-sea trade corridor, a strategy that links railways, highways, and now canals, particularly in underdeveloped Western regions. The idea is to give them direct access to Southeast Asia and global markets. Look, all of this sounds impressive, but actually understanding how something like this works, that takes more than just watching a few videos. And that's where today's sponsor, Brilliant, comes in. Brilliant helps you get smarter every day with thousands of interactive lessons in math, science, programming, data analysis, and AI. 
You're not just watching lectures, you're solving problems, testing ideas, and learning by doing. If you're the kind of person who's curious about how canal locks work, how energy flows through systems, or how to think through problems like an engineer, this is for you. You can try Brilliant Free for 30 days using my link, and you'll also get 20% off a full year of premium. Just click the link in the description or scan the QR code on screen to get started. All right, now let's get back to our topic. For decades, most trade and investment has flowed into China's eastern cities. This corridor is meant to even out that imbalance, giving western provinces faster and cheaper access to international markets, especially in Southeast Asia. Shipping by water uses about one-fifth the fuel per ton of cargo compared to road transport. That means fewer emissions, less fuel burned, and a more sustainable supply chain. For a country trying to clean up its logistics sector, that matters. And then there's the issue of redundancy. Most of China's exports travel through a handful of coastal ports. If those ever face disruptions because of weather, congestion, or geopolitics, having an inland alternative like Pinglu gives the country more control over its own trade routes. Construction officially began in August 2023, with a total budget estimated at around $10 billion. It's expected to be completed by 2026, and once operational, it will allow ships to move between inland factories and international ports without needing to touch a single highway or railway line. The canal is also designed to handle up to 5,000-ton vessels, which are typically used for bulk goods. At full capacity, it's expected to carry over 95 million tons of cargo annually, roughly double what the Panama Canal moved in its early years. To put that in perspective, that's the weight of 950,000 fully loaded freight train cars. And unlike rivers that are at the mercy of natural flow and flooding, this canal is engineered from scratch, controlled, planned, and built for efficiency. However, building a massive canal from scratch is no small job, especially when that stretch of land is not flat. The Pinglu Canal cuts through mountains, hills, rivers, and villages. It requires rerouting roads, relocating residents, and reshaping the landscape in ways that are both massive and precise. One of the biggest engineering challenges is the elevation difference between various parts of the canal. That's why the project includes three large ship locks, which act like water elevators for vessels. The biggest of them, called the Tiandang Lock, will be the largest water-saving ship lock ever built designed to move massive ships up and down steep height changes while minimizing water loss. That's critical in this part of the country, where seasonal droughts can cause water shortages. Traditional locks waste huge volumes of water with every use. The Tianding Lock is designed to recycle most of its water, dramatically cutting consumption. The canal route also includes over 90 bridges and more than 40 kilometers of excavated terrain including several deep-cut rock sections. In some areas, they're removing up to 13 million cubic meters of earth, enough to fill more than 5,000 Olympic-sized swimming pools. And unlike older canals, this one is being built to modern standards, reinforced embankments, automated water control systems, and integration with smart logistics platforms. Thousands of workers are on site, dozens of heavy machines, Excavators, dredgers, concrete pumps are operating around the clock. Coordinating all of this across such a long and narrow corridor is an engineering challenge in itself. But the result will be a canal that functions more like a highway than a traditional waterway, capable of handling large-scale traffic efficiently and reliably with minimal maintenance. It's a mix of brute force and tech coordination, China's usual style when it comes to megaprojects. But how does it stack up against other famous canals around the world? When people think of canals that change the way we move goods, two names usually come up, Panama and Suez. Those canals connect oceans. The Pinglu Canal doesn't. It's inland, and it connects rivers to a gulf. So no, it's not competing with Panama or Suez on global sea traffic. But that's not the point. Where those canals are about international shipping shortcuts, Pinglu is all about domestic efficiency. 
So while it might not have the same global fame, it is just as strategic for China as Panama is for the US or Suez is for Egypt. And economically, it might be even more important for the regions it's connected to. So how exactly will it change things on the ground? At full operation, the Pinglu Canal is expected to handle over 95 million tons of cargo every year. That's not just a nice number, it represents a huge shift in how goods move across southern China. Think about this. Right now, moving bulk cargo from inland factories to coastal ports means loading it onto trucks or trains, often for journeys of 700 to 1,000 kilometers. That costs time and money, especially for heavy materials like coal, cement, grain, or steel. By contrast, the canal will allow these same goods to float directly to the coast, cheaper, faster, and with fewer emissions. In fact, some estimates suggest that for certain routes, this canal could cut shipping distances by up to 560 kilometers. That's a full day saved on transport time. For China's inland provinces, this could be a game changer. Cities like Liuzhou and Nanning, which once sat far from major shipping routes, now have a chance to become regional trade hubs. Industrial parks, logistics centers, and export zones are already being planned along the canal's route. Ports on the Beibu Gulf, especially Qinzhou, Fangchenggang, and Beihai, are expanding as well. These used to be considered second-tier ports. But with the canal feeding them a steady stream of inland cargo, they're being repositioned as serious players in China's broader trade strategy. On a national level, the canal gives China more control over its internal logistics. Instead of relying entirely on a few eastern megacities, the country now has a new corridor for moving goods to Southeast Asia and beyond. And in a time when global supply chains are constantly under pressure, that flexibility is worth a lot. There's also a diplomatic benefit. The Pinglu Canal strengthens China's trade ties with Vietnam, Thailand, and Malaysia. It creates a southern trade route that bypasses some of the more heavily monitored and politically sensitive sea lanes near Taiwan or the South China Sea. In short, this is not just infrastructure, it's leverage. Still, big construction projects come with trade-offs, and this one is no exception. You can't dig a canal through 134 kilometers of land without affecting the people and environment that already live there. Let's start with the human side. Thousands of residents along the planned route have been relocated. In many cases, entire villages were cleared to make way for the canal's path. The government has offered compensation packages, but not everyone is satisfied. For older residents especially, losing ancestral land or being forced to leave long-standing communities is about more than money. It's about identity, history, and connection to place. Some have raised concerns about how quickly the relocations have taken place and whether the new housing and job options provided are adequate. Then there's the environmental cost. The canal route slices through wetlands, farmlands, forests, and areas that support regional biodiversity. This puts pressure on local ecosystems, from fish populations to migratory birds to groundwater supplies. To deal with that, the government and engineering teams have built in several safeguards, ecological corridors to help wildlife move across the canal without being cut off, water-saving locks to reduce overall water consumption, real-time monitoring systems that track water quality, vegetation health, and even wildlife activity, silt traps and drainage basins to prevent erosion and sediment from damaging nearby rivers. And while these features are promising, environmental experts have warned that they'll need long-term oversight and maintenance to work as intended especially during extreme weather events like floods or droughts. There's also the issue of water supply itself. The canal draws water from the Sijin Reservoir, which is located on the Yu River in Hengzhou, Guangxi Province, and in dry seasons that could strain both agriculture and drinking water sources for nearby communities. Engineers say they've accounted for this by building reservoirs and diversion systems, but in a changing climate, nothing is guaranteed.
Finally, even though shipping is cleaner than trucking, an increase in ship traffic means more emissions, more noise, and a higher chance of accidental pollution from fuel leaks or cargo spills, especially in areas that were previously quiet and rural. So while the canal offers serious benefits for trade, its long-term sustainability will depend on whether China can balance economic gain with environmental and social responsibility. So what happens when it finally opens? Once it's fully operational, likely by 2026, the Pinglu Canal will do more than just move cargo. It could completely reshape how southern and western China participate in global trade. Local governments expect the canal to carry millions of tons of goods every year, but that number could go even higher as industrial zones, export hubs, and manufacturing parks start popping up along the route. But with big ambitions come big risks. One of the biggest concerns is underutilization. If industries don't shift their logistics models to take advantage of the canal, it could sit partially empty, like other megaprojects that struggled to find consistent use after completion. There's also the long-term challenge of maintenance. Locks, bridges, and automated systems require constant care. And keeping the canal navigable, especially during dry seasons, means watching water levels and managing sediment buildup year-round. Environmental management will be another test. Officials promise ongoing real-time monitoring, but staying ahead of climate shifts and water stress will require continued investment and transparency. And then there's the question of balance. Can this canal bring real economic opportunity without permanently damaging the environment or displacing vulnerable communities? That's the long game and one that local governments will have to navigate carefully. Still, there's no denying the scope of what's happening here. China is doing something no other country is attempting at this scale, building a high-tech inland canal system in record time to solve both economic and strategic problems in one stroke. So is this all worth it? Well, the Pinglu Canal might not grab headlines like the Suez or Panama, but for China, it's just as important it's a $10 billion infrastructure gamble aimed at unlocking inland trade, reducing transport costs, and giving the country more control over its own supply chains. For now, construction is moving fast, and China is betting big. If it works, this canal could become a model for other countries looking to reconnect their inland regions to the global economy without relying solely on trucks and rails. So what do you think? Should more countries be building inland canals to ease congestion and cut logistics costs? Or are the risks, environmental, social, and financial, just too high? Let us know in the comments below.